somewhere deep in bear country lives the Bernstein Bear family. <laughs> the kind of furry around the torso. They're a lot like people. Good evening. In the news tonight, another Vincent's teacher kicks off his campaign for a seat in the Indiana General Assembly. And American journalist Jill Carroll has been freed from her captors in Iraq. In sports, Major League Baseball is opening an investigation into steroid use. And the Pacers will retire Reggie Miller's jersey tonight. News Center 22 is next. <laughs> Two Vincennes school teachers are running for political office this year. Vincennes Lincoln High School teacher Craig Battles is seeking the Democrat nomination to oppose Republican incumbent Troy Woodruff in the, dis in the District 64 state representative race in the fall. And Clark Middle School teacher Steve Tace is seeking the Democrat nomination to oppose incumbent Republican John Waterman of Shelburne for the state Senate seat in District 39. Tace, who is also a Knox County Councilman, kicked off his campaign this morning on the steps of the Knox County Courthouse, saying several issues motivated him to run. Funding for the schools in this area, and I feel that when they uh, pass the uh, major moves without some modifications that I think should have been in that bill, and uh, for just the uh, property tax reform that uh, I think needs to have something happening on that front. Tace says he doesn't have the answer to eliminating the property tax, but says it needs to be studied and believes it can be done. Tace also blasted Republicans for not listening to the people when it came to vote on the Daylight Savings Time bill in 2005. If he is elected, Tace would be temporarily excused from his teaching duties without pay for the second semester. He says the school system would then hire qualified replacement. The 39th district includes all or parts of Clay, Green, Knox, Monroe, Owen, Sullivan, and Vigo counties. Auto supplier Visteon Corporation plans to lay off 74 hourly workers at its Bedford, Indiana plant. The layoffs take effect Monday. Visteon spokesman Christopher Walton says the layoffs are permanent. He says the plant had too many people on temporary layoffs to remain competitive. Visteon transferred some plants back to its former owner Ford last year and said this month it plans to move more of its production overseas over the next two years. The plant in Bedford, about 65 miles southwest of Indianapolis, currently employs about 975 hourly and salaried workers. Dave Tusek, a meteorologist with the National Weather Service, says advances in technology have made his job easier in predicting where severe weather may strike. However, Tusek says they still have, rely heavily on information provided by a network of weather spotters around the state. There are our local, what we call the local ground truth, because our radar doesn't see down to the ground. That's where we have the spotters. Let us know what's taking place here. Then we tie that up to with what we see taking place on radar. Tusek says they've probably trained over 7,000 people across the state to become weather spotters. Although some are more active than others, Tusek says anytime they have something significant to report, they can either contact 911 or the National Weather Service directly by phone, radio, or via the internet. Tusek added that Knox County residents can keep abreast of the latest weather information by purchasing a weather radio at any electronics department store. He says the radios have an audible alarm that can wake, up you, wake you up during severe weather. Most of them are also equipped with a battery backup in the event you lose power at your house. Ivy Tech and Purdue University North Central have signed a partnership agreement to make it easier for community college students to transfer into four-year degree programs. The agreement will allow more Ivy Tech community college students to transfer to bachelor degree programs offered at the Purdue Branch campus in Westville. The two colleges began a transfer partnership several years ago, allowing Ivy Tech students to transfer into certain Purdue programs. The more expansive new agreement applies to all the Purdue degrees offered at the North Central campus. Officials at Purdue University North Central hope that the agreement will bring them more students. They hope to grow from a campus of 3,500 students to about 5,000. 
The investigation continues today in the armed robbery of a Princeton bank on Wednesday. Police say a white male displayed a gun and demanded cash from the tellers at Citizen State Bank. There were no customers in the bank at the time and no one was injured. The Bureau of Motor Vehicles hopes a new call center will provide quicker answers to motorists and reduce the number of callers who hang up in frustration. The new center at the agency's headquarters in the Indiana Government Center merges several help desks. It staffs 42 associates and supervisors, each trained in many areas including licenses, registrations, and state identification cards. Before many callers had to be transferred to several employees to obtain answers to multiple questions. BMV Commissioner Joel Silverman estimates about 40 percent of people would be disconnected for technical reasons or long waiting times. The new call center will automatically transfer callers to the first available associate and will monitor calls to gauge efficiency. Maryland police say they, de they detained three young people from Evansville, Indiana after they were seen at a drugstore buying large amounts of over-the-counter cold medicine. Police say the group admitted they planned to resell the medicine in their home state to people they know who would use it to make methamphetamine. In all, police seized 103 boxes of the medication bought from several stores in the Millersville area near Annapolis Tuesday evening. Police say two men ages 21 and 22 were on spring break from a trade school and traveled to Maryland with a 17-year-old girl to buy the cold medicine because Maryland has less stringent regulations for its sale. The three broke no Maryland laws and have been released. A struggling museum chronicling the short life of actor James Dean has closed its doors for good. The James Dean Gallery opened in 2004. It was in Gas City, about halfway between Indianapolis and Fort Wayne on Interstate 69. Owner David Lohr says an outpouring of contributions from Dean fans wasn't enough to keep the museum open. He's now placed most of his memorabilia in storage. Dean was 24 in 1955 when he died in a car crash in California. He starred in just three movies. Still to come on News Center 22, American reporter Jill Carroll was released by her kidnappers in Iraq today, and a report on the impact of illegal immigrants on agriculture in the United States. Stay with us. Jill Carroll says she spent three months in a furnished room with a window and a shower, but she never knew just where she was being held. Iraqi police say the American journalist was freed this morning to walk into an office of Iraq's main Sunni political party and give them a letter in Arabic asking for help. Now she says she just wants to be home. President Bush is among the many people around the world who are pleased that Carroll has been released. Just really grateful she's released. And I want to thank those who worked hard to release her. And we're glad she's alive. Spokesman says the military wasn't involved in Carol's release today. During her time as a hostage, Carol's kidnappers demanded the release of all female detainees in Iraq. A short time later, five female detainees were released. The Pentagon spokesman says there are still five female prisoners being held in detention centers in Iraq. The U.S. military has reported two American deaths today. One was a soldier who died Tuesday of wounds he received in fighting in Fallujah. The other was an airman killed today near Baghdad. A fellow airman was injured when he tried to disarm a roadside bomb. According to a new poll from the social science group Public Agenda, Americans are skeptical of the ability of the U.S. to export democracy and they're divided on whether successful efforts abroad could actually make the U.S. safer. Only about a third of those surveyed believes the U.S. can help spread democracy. That's a major objective for Iraq and throughout the Middle East. And just one in five thinks the U.S. will be able to do a lot to create democracy in Iraq. 
On the other hand, nearly three quarters of those surveyed say they've worried that American actions in the Middle East are indirectly helping recruit terrorists. Immigration is a hot topic during a two-day summit with U.S., Mexican, and Canadian leaders. President Bush is at the summit in Cancun, where he's expected to seek support for a guest worker program currently being debated in the Senate. The guest worker program would allow immigrants from Mexico and other countries to work legally in the United States for up to six years before returning to their home countries. It would also give nearly 12 million immigrants already in the United States illegally the chance to work toward legal status. Critics say that equates to amnesty. Among other topics of conversation at the summit will be border security and trade issues. It could be winter before Congress passes an immigration bill. There is a growing belief on Capitol Hill that political concerns will delay a compromise between the House and Senate versions of the bill until after the November elections. The House passed legislation is limited to border enforcement. The Senate has just started debate on a bill that is expected to include a guest worker provision. The immigration debate is capturing the headlines this week. American farmers are watching it closely and anxiously. Some say their very livelihoods are on the line. Sumi Das reports. From coast to coast, Americans eat berries grown in Oxnard, California, and picked by immigrant workers. This grower wants to remain anonymous. We'll call him Tom. He's been in the strawberry business all his life. I've never had an American come ask me if they could pick strawberries. Or I've never had an American come ask me for any job on the farm. Tom says he only employs workers who show him legal documents. He says he doubts there will be new federal laws making the hiring of undocumented workers a felony, but says if it happens, the effects will be crippling. If you shut the border down and you, and you eliminate our workforce, the, you know, fresh produce in this country shuts down with it. And says Tom, the price of strawberries skyrockets, or the fruit vanishes from store shelves and our tables altogether. Strawberry growers and the United Farm Workers Union rarely agree on anything, but on this, they see eye to eye. American agriculture as we know it would collapse. Americans would no longer be able to buy most fresh fruits and vegetables, at least not many that are produced in America. But when it comes to a solution, the two parties are far apart. Tom favors a guest worker program that's light on red tape and quick to get workers in the fields. President Bush has proposed a guest worker program that would allow individuals to work in the U.S. for three years, with the possibility of a three-year extension before they must return to their home countries. The United Farm Workers say the prospect doesn't hold appeal for the many undocumented workers whose roots in the U.S. run deep. Their families are here. They go to church in their hometowns. They're not going to volunteer to participate in a program that only promises them deportation if they follow all the rules. The grower we talked to said at the peak of strawberry season, pickers earn about $10 to $12 an hour. That may sound like a decent wage, but bear in mind it's not year-round, only at the height of the season. And when you break it down, it works out to about $0.12 cents a pint. Now, we just bought this basket at the market. It cost $3. Sumi Das, CNN, Oxnard, California. Today is a very big day for Randall McCloy. The sole survivor of the Sago mine disaster went home from a rehab facility in Morgantown, West Virginia. McCloy made a short statement during a news conference. Yeah, I'd just like to thank everybody for their thoughts and prayers. Uh, I believe that's it. <laughs> thank you all. The 26-year-old McCloy has been hosp hospitalized since January. A Category 4 cyclone is hitting Australia's remote northwestern coast with strong winds and heavy rains. Just last week, a major cyclone battered Australia's east coast. The cyclone with forecast winds of 150 miles an hour is expected to take several hours to pass over land. Western Australia's Pilbara coastline has few major towns, but there are many large mining complexes in the area. Today is the anniversary of an attempt to kill Ronald Reagan. 25 years ago, John Hinckley fired shots that struck the new president and three others outside a Washington hotel. 
Hinckley was said to be trying to impress actress Jodie Foster. He was later found insane. When you think of Las Vegas, you usually think of big jackpots. But now the city also has a big ambulance. The $250,000 oversized ambulance will be able to respond to calls involving overweight, uh, overweight patients. American Medical Response says it has handled 75 calls in the last six months for patients weighing more than 600 pounds. The oversized ambulance is equipped with a larger gurney, a winch, and ramps to load patients up to 1,600 pounds. Still to come on News Center 22, Amy Reef says thunderstorms are headed our way. Stay with us. Tune in to WVUT this Thursday night. Watch This Old House at 8, then stay tuned for Antiques Roadshow at 9. Items appraised in the last of three episodes in Los Angeles include rhinestone studded western style clothes created by Nudie Cone and a collection of barbershop shaving mugs from the 1930s. Then at 10, the story of one traces the history of the numeral one, including its effect on civilizations. Thursday night on WVUT. Well, Amy, it's been a beautiful day today. It has been very nice, gorgeous, gorgeous weather out today. Is that expected to last? Well, the warmer temperatures are going to stick around, but unfortunately, we do have some rain on the way. Good evening, everyone. As we take a look outside to the tower cam, we currently have sunny skies and 75 degrees. Wind is out of the south at 17 miles per hour. The humidity is at 39%, and the barometric pressure is at 30.04 and falling. <clears throat> As we take a look at some area temperatures in Indiana, sunny Washington is at 76 degrees and Sullivan is at 73. Over in Illinois, Ani is under partly, partly cloudy skies at 74 degrees and Robinson under sunny skies also 74 degrees. Now as we take a look at our national temperature map, chillier than normal temperatures out in the west. Currently we have Great Falls, Montana at 32 degrees and we have Flagstaff, Arizona at 40 degrees. Now, quite a different story out on the East Coast. Beautiful, beautiful weather. The nation's capital currently at 67 degrees, and things are starting to heat up down south. We have Brownsville, Texas at 83. Now, as we bring in our surface map, we have an area of high pressure over both, both the north and the southeast, um, generating some sunny skies and fair conditions, also some warmer temperatures, finally starting to look like spring for the folks out there. But as we all know, along with spring comes some showers. Here we can see a low pressure system mixing in with a jet stream producing some triple threat thunderstorms generating some gusty winds of up to 60 miles per hour, large golf ball sized hail, and possibly even tornadoes. Now these systems are going to start to line up continuing to push their way east, eventually making it to the Wabash Valley sometime later this evening. Behind that to the north we have another system over Montana and North Dakota generating some light rain, some moderate fog, and possibly even some snow showers also going to continue pushing its way east over the evening. But behind that in the west, not much to speak of. Sunny skies and fair conditions as they start to dry out a little bit after the system that just passed through. Now let's take a look at your forecast. For tonight, thunderstorms with a low of 60. Tomorrow, thunderstorms with a high of 68. And tomorrow night, mostly clear with a low of 46. Now for a look at your extended forecast. Saturday, partly cloudy with a high of 60, low of 46. Sunday, thunderstorms with a high of 73 and a low of 58. And Monday, partly cloudy skies with a high of 63 and a low of 42. And Kurt, that's a look for your weather. Thanks, Amy. Still to come on New Center 22, baseball has opened an investigation into steroid use among players. Kristen Miller will have the details coming up in sports. <music> Marry a millionaire? Get real. Real college, real experience, real careers, really fast. Vincent's University Preview Days, April 21st or 22nd. Register at VINU.edu. Win the lottery? Get real. Real college, real experience, 
real careers really fast. Vincent's University Preview Days, April 21st and 22nd. Go to vinu.edu. Going after the Chiefs. Good evening, everyone, for TV22 Sports. I'm Kristen Miller. Commissioner Bud Selig announced today that Major League Baseball is opening an investigation into alleged steroid use by some players. And former Senate Majority Leader George Mitchell has been placed in charge of the inquiry. San Francisco slugger Barry Bonds is sure to be one of the targets of the probe. A recently released book chronicles his alleged use of performance enhancing substances. In a related note, Balco founder Victor Conti has been released today from a California prison where he spent four months for orchestrating an, illeg an illegal steroids distribution scheme that allegedly involved high-profile athletes. In the NBA last night, Al Harrington had 23 points and 8 rebounds to lead the Atlanta Hawks in a 94-93 victory over the Indiana Pacers. The win ends Atlanta's five-game losing streak. Pacers' Peja Stoyakovic hit four three-pointers in the final four minutes, but Atlanta's best defender, Joe Johnson, kept Stoyakovic from touching the ball on the Pacers' final possession. The Pacers have lost five of their last six games on the road. Indiana has dropped to seventh place in the Eastern Conference playoff race, just one half game behind Milwaukee. The Pacers host the Phoenix Suns tonight, but the most memorable part of the game may be halftime. The Pacers will retire number 31 jersey worn by Reggie Miller. He'll join former Pacer players Roger Brown, Mel Daniels, George McMinnis, and former coach Bob Slick Leonard to receive the honor. Cleveland wrapped up its first playoff berth in eight years by downing Dallas 107-94. LeBron James scored 46 points on 16 of 23 shooting to lead the Cavs to their sixth straight win. The Mavericks have dropped three of four to fall a game and a half behind San Antonio for the Western Conference lead. Dirk Nowitzki scored 29 points and Jerry Stackhouse added 23 for Dallas. Also in the NBA, Detroit beat Philadelphia 101-91, giving the Pistons a two-game lead over San Antonio in the NBA's overall standings. Chauncey Billups and Antonio McDice each scored 18 points as the Pistons dropped the 76ers, a season worst six games under 500. Allen Iverson finished with 28 points and Chris Reber added 23, but the rest of Philly's starters combined for 14. DJ White says he's still weighing his options to decide whether he'll continue playing for Indiana University under its new basketball coach, Calvin Sampson. Both White and Robert Vaden are two of Indiana's key players, and they have said they'll follow former coach Mike Davis wherever he lands. While White and about half a dozen current players attended today's conference announcing Sampson's new position, Vaden did not. White insists neither his appearance nor Vaden's absence is a signal of what either player will decide. Texas Tech is expected to announce today that it is hiring Purdue coach Christy Curry to coach the Lady Raider basketball team. Purdue Athletic Director Morgan Burke confirmed that Curry is leaving for Tech where Bob Knight coaches the men's team. The past two champions will play for the men's NIT crown tonight. Michigan won the title in 2004 with most of the same players who have led this year's run to Madison Square Garden. South Carolina won it all last season and four of their starters are back to try to do it again. The men's Final Four basketball teams have gathered in Indianapolis to continue preparing for the national semifinals. George Mason plays Florida at UCLA and takes on LSU on Saturday night. UCLA backup center Lorenzo Mata broke his nose during the Bruins' first practice after arriving for the Final Four and will wear a mask against the Tigers. It's the second time this year Mata has broken his nose. The first major LPGA tournament of the year is underway in California. Annika Sorenstam is the defending champion at the Kraft Nabisco Championship. Teenage sensations Morgan Purcell, Paula Creamer, and Michelle Wee are also part of the 100-player field. They're playing the opening round of the Bell South Classic today at the TPC Sugarloaf Layout in Duluth, Georgia. 
Tiffany champion and two-time event winner Phil Mickelson heads up the diluted field. Many of the top golfers are skipping this event to work on their game ahead of next week's Masters. Gavin Coles is the clubhouse leader after an 8 under par 64. NFL owners have voted 29 to 3 to limit end zone demonstrations, including those with props such as Cincinnati's Chad Johnson using an end zone pylon to putt the football. His river dance routine will be allowed because he stayed on his feet. The penalty for a band celebration will be 15 yards for unsportsmanlike conduct. Finally in sports, John Wooden has basketball events and the court at UCLA's Poly Pavilion named in his honor. Soon he could have his own post office. California Congressman Brad Sherman today introduced legislation to name the Reseda, California post office as the Coach John Wooden post office. Sherman says with the Bruins once again in the Final Four, the timing couldn't be better. And Kurt, that's a look at sports. Thanks, Kristen. Still to come on New Center 22, Blinging Up Baby. Stay with us. Coming up this week on 22 Magazine, we'll learn more about three advanced manufacturing students at Vincennes University who recently placed first, second, and third in a recent national technology competition. And Dan Ravelette, Vincennes Mayor Terry Mooney's chief of staff, will be here to talk about a new project to get school kids to color and remember the city's history. The next time on 22 Magazine, Saturday night at 7.30 on WVUT. Would you ever spend $900 on a baby carriage or $100 on a littlest pair of jeans? Some families are forking over big bucks for their babies, so much so that the market for luxury baby products is booming. Kelly Wallace reports. Was there always this much choice? No, no, absolutely not. This is a new phenomenon. This is a new phenomenon. Call it blinging up baby, luxury products, and more of them than ever before for the littlest ones. Beautiful little dress. Beautiful for $455. It's, it's expensive. <laughs> we went shopping at Barney's, one of New York's most exclusive stores with Pilar Guzman, editor-in-chief of Cookie, a new high-end baby magazine which focuses on lifestyle. What do you say to people when they say, but $500 almost for a dress that you yeah. can only wear for a little bit of time? You know, it's, it's, uh, it's certainly not for everyone and it's, you know, luxury is really kind of a state of mind. Luxury for babies is also big business, fueled by more couples who are starting families later in life when they have more disposable income. So, they're buying $450 diaper bags and $215 Dolce & Gabbana dresses, just like mom might wear. The mini-me phenomenon is, you know, I dress a certain way, my kid is sort of an extension of, of me, and I want my kid to dress the way I dress. But has it all gone too far? Elise McAdam, mother of 13-month-old Felix, writes the blog Indie Mom. She says she's heard from plenty of moms who say this is over the top. To me, I think the, what it sort of drags up are those horrible feelings of middle school where all of a sudden you're being judged on what you wear or and what your child is wearing. I say stop the train. But Guzman, who has a two-year-old and is expecting her second child in June, says it's all about doing what works for your lifestyle. For her, that means mixing high and low, shopping for Henry at Target, while also buying cashmere sweaters worth about $200. Nobody wants to raise a spoiled brat and all of that, um, but at the same time, it's all about what you like and what reflects your life and your taste and your state of mind. Where are we going as a society, Felix? Are we going, is it gonna get even more over the top? What do you think? What are you hearing from you? How much your... more over the top can it get? I mean, it's, I mean that's the thing. I, I just don't know how much you know, further it can go. Kelly Wallace, CNN, New York. And that's all for this evening. For Amy Reef and Kristen Miller, I'm Kurt Maddox. Good night.